Ananda will explain something about the uh, community advisory boards, and then we have two uh, case studies to present. Then we have a coffee break, and then we go to um, uh, the smaller workshops specific on uh, topics we chose for you. Then we have an, again a coffee break and another three sessions, as you can see on the program. Then we have lunch, um, and then in the afternoon we have a few rotating sessions with another um, few topics we as patient advocates, uh, advocates are busy with or can benefit from each other's uh, experience and uh, exchange our experience in this. Then we have another coffee break and the last uh, um, lecture session, interactive session, is about the journey to uh, get a professional and empowered advocate. And that will be presented by uh, the well-known uh, patient advocate, um, Jan Geisler. Most of you know him, I think. Uh, we're very proud that he will be in our program. And then we uh, go, uh, well, just to fresh each other's up uh, in our rooms. And then we go to an off-site dinner somewhere in Brussels, uh, which is also, to me, still a secret, but we'll know uh, where it will be. It will be absolutely a nice uh, site, I think. Have a very good and interesting day today. Thank you. Could I please have my slides? So anyway, um, good morning to everyone. I hope you enjoyed the day yesterday, and um, and and I hope that today is also going to be fruitful, and you're you're going to get many uh, interesting insights uh, you can take home. Um, I have a quite quite an um, a difficult task this morning to. Um, try and introduce you to a new model um, that, well, I'll, I'll give my best. You know, um, we've all um, attended um, pharma ad boards um, organized by industry, where the agenda is set by industry, and um, I guess no one in the room has um, not attended these. And the feeling you get when you go to these, and I, I'm very aware that we have our um, pharma colleagues in the room, um, but I guess you will take this as a positive criticism. Uh, often the feeling that you get is that it is more like a family meeting, which is very nice. You get to see the faces you, you, know, you haven't seen for a while. You get together, you talk about nice topics. Um, you do not go out of your comfort zone, but it's nice. But what happens afterwards? Um, the issue that we've identified within the community with these advisory boards, and not all of them, but most of them, is um, that you don't really know what the outcome of these advisory boards are. Um, there's usually lack of follow-up so you, the ad board finishes and then it's like a ticking box exercise and you do not really know what happened with the input you gave or... And also the topics covered are not really the ones that one feels um, address the needs and wants of patients. And that has to do with the fact that we're not involved in designing the agenda but also in inviting the people that should be at the table, because it is very different to talk about access than talking about involvement of patients in research and development. And it is also very different to speak about evidence or to speak about quality of life. And within our community, we have a lot of expertise, no doubt of that, but we, not all of us are experts in everything. So the fact that we invite, you know, just those usual suspects, which, you know, <laughs> I count myself to one of them because I'm always invited to these ad boards, 
is not meaningful because the person sitting there, you do not know and you haven't assessed whether that person is really an expert on the topic you're going to be speaking about. And I think we within the community have an important role in identifying the people with talent, the people with a lot of knowledge, and those people that have great potential. And that is what I'm going to be speaking about today. An attempt to try and change that approach where it is industry that invites us to the table, it is industry who identifies for whatever reason, sometimes even political reasons, because the affiliate says this person has to be in the room, um, the participants, and ensure that the outcome is the one that we're looking for, because we're all here for the same reason. We want our people to stop dying, and we want our people to live a good life. Okay, so keeping that in mind, community advisory boards, also called CAPS in short. What are CAPS? Um, CAPS are the exact opposite. It's like a tortilla. You turn it around, and this is what you get. You get patient community advisory boards, which are um, where the agenda is set by the patient community, and they are the ones inviting the stakeholders. This can happen with any stakeholder. Um, it doesn't have to be industry. However, it is much easier to start with industry because it's the partner we're most familiar with, and it's the partner where, you know, I guess um, the input given has the greatest impact at, at the first stage. It is a two-way dialogue. Um, and it really, what it wants to do is to tackle the outcome. So you give input to the stakeholders attending, the stakeholders attending give feedback, feedback back, and, uh, and you attempt to move forward after that meeting and attempt to build upon each meeting you have, each cap you have is a build up of the previous one, which is something we haven't had in the past either. You go to the advisory boards and it is always the same thing you start with. Um, it is a global platform um, where the patient community feeds in the needs and the views and the wants of, of patients. Uh, and there it is important obviously to have a good, uh, a good um, backup of data and evidence, which is a topic we're gonna speak about later going in those meetings knowing exactly what your community wants and needs and having evidence that supports what you're saying. It addresses challenges that patients face in accessing optimal diagnosis, monitoring, treatment and care. It improves quality of patient information. It develops patient-focused trials and it builds capacity and knowledge within our community. How do they work? So I've, I've tried to look in and probably, you know, the speaker will have this afternoon, which is Jan Geisler, would be much more suitable for giving this talk than me, but uh, because he's already done it and I haven't. <laughs> but, uh, but at the moment, we're um, um, in the process of running a pilot within the hematology community for building this kind of approach. But EATG, which is the European AIDS Treatment Group, has done it for many years, even decades, and the CML Advocates Network um, has done it as well. And it's been quite successful. And I uh, think we have industry partners in the room that can maybe give feedback afterwards and tell you their, um, their point of view of how these meetings um, are lived by them. So it it goes this way. Patient organizations invite um, uh, the industry partners, but they do not invite the marketing department, which often is the person that you will get when you go to an advisory board, but you invite the key people that you need to talk to, and not only the people of the department you need to talk to, but the people that are able to actually decide on whether something is relevant or not in their department. Because what you usually get is the reply, ooh, I, I don't know, I need to talk to my superior. 
And that is not useful within the CAP because we need to move forward. We've been doing this for many years and you know the, the pace at which things are developing is just too, too slow. Um, patients, organizations set the agenda and pick the topics. It is true, and this was raised yesterday, that industry obviously has the opportunity to feed in and to propose topics. However, if the community feels that these are not relevant, they will not be discussed. Participants discussing confidentiality. And uh, this is something I'll go into afterwards because sometimes, you know, there are big advocates within our community also that say that confidentiality is not important. For me as a, as a lawyer, um, obviously I understand what confidentiality means and I, I you know, I think that the importance, you, you need to keep it within a certain, a certain framework. Do not stamp everything as confidential, but there are certain topics that need to be confidential in order to have an honest discussion with the partner you're sitting at the table with. Patient organizations provide public minutes and confidential minutes. Um, and you might ask, well, it has to do with the confidentiality point. Um, what the community, the community needs to be informed because we live, we do not want to build an elite club what we want to do is have a group of people that can, you know, move things forward. But you want the rest of the community to be well informed and to feed back to that group and let them know, you know, whether they're doing a good job or not in order to improve as well. And, and in those minutes, you will not write the confidential information because if that gets out, you're in deep trouble, that's the first thing. But the other is that the conversations you will have your, with your partner will not be as uh, deep as you would like them to and as fruitful as you would like them to because they won't trust you. Um, so the public ones contain limited information, the confidential uh, items go out. And in the, uh, in the private ones, in the, um, in the ones that are um, circulated within the CAP members, you have everything. Um, and, and the other very important point is that CAP members uh, always receive training. And uh, you'll see it afterwards, the, um, the training sessions are um, mandatory. That is to say, you, you will always get people that say, oh, but on Friday, you know, it's my husband's birthday and um, I, you know, I would like to fly in later. Well, in that case, you won't be participating in the CAP because the whole point of doing this is not only, you know, preaching to others, but also making sure that we're moving forward and that we ourselves are getting educated and are improving the knowledge that we have within the community. So this is how it looks. You will have uh, day one, which starts in the afternoon, and you have the training session for the CAP members. Then you have day two, which starts with, with, uh, with a session um, um, with one of the companies. Um, day two continues. You have maybe the preparatory session for uh, before the meeting in order for everyone to be briefed, and so on and so forth. Um, and and the preparatory sessions are there to align and to also um, prepare the people that will be attending the CAP meeting on any important issues that might come up during the meeting with industry. Any you know, important information that we might know among ourselves about what is happening in the company or in the pipeline or anything like that. Um, and then after that, you have the confidential uh, company sessions. Um, important also to note that companies do not sit together. It's not all the companies sitting in one room with you, but it's separate. So each of them can talk about their stuff without having the competitor in the room. Um, so how have we done this in the hematology community? Um, uh, uh, aligned with what the CML community has done. We have a protocol and it's a bit of copy-paste exercise we've done from the uh, European AIDS treatment group um, where you, <laughs> it reminds me a bit of a parliamentary process because it's very strict. Um, uh, you have the purpose, the topics, the schedule, the membership, governance, all of these things that you see on the slide. Um, are included in the protocol and uh, very well um, 
uh, explained and um, um, and the scope is very well limited. So why do we need confidentiality? Well, I, I already touched upon that. To discuss those matters that are of the highest relevance for the community, um, not only for the patient community, but also for industry in order for us to move forward. And, uh, and also the information, so the most relevant one, and that information that for the company is commercially sensitive. Um, and here you have some examples on what would be confidential. Um, it's the corporate strategies, the developments of the pipeline, and so on and so forth. And the non-confidential, as you would expect and you can find in any agreement you sign, uh, um, are things that are published and concepts that are, that are not, um, not, not sensitive for the company. Um, so the, this is the pilot I was talking about. This is what is happening in the hematology community at the moment. Um, we're organizing this with, across diseases. It's an experiment, so um, bear with us. It might go wrong, but if it does go right, then this would be a huge achievement because what we're doing is um, actually cross disease. So all of our you know, patient advocate um, colleagues in the hematology community um, have concerns that overlap with ours. And why would we address that in a disease specific um, community advisory board? It makes no sense. Let's get all of us together and let's, let's do it together. And that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna attach this to EHA and, um, and, and see what comes out. So the potential topics you can see, it could be patient engagement in R&D in a general way, um, in a disease specific um, um, area, you would, you would talk about how specifically you as a, a patient advocate can be involved in a specific protocol. Um, of, of a trial. And here you would discuss about um, the roadmap in general of engagement of patients in R&D, uh, building patient evidence and evidence-based advocacy, access to drugs, to trials, to diagnostics and so on, policy issues um, and uh, approaches to new uh, therapeutic areas like CAR T cell, for instance. Participation policy this must be very strict because obviously you know there's 11 umbrellas um, and uh, and so the criteria for inclusion of all of these is that each organization can nominate one person for MPE it's Hans um, and uh, and then since this is organized by the uh, APACs which are the elected representatives of the patient community for the European Reference Network in Hematology. I know this is very complex. <laughs> Elected uh, in the rare disease community. Um, and they are moving this, they are organizing this. So these seven people will be attending as well. And I happen to be one of them. Um, so, so what do we want from the leader? What is Hans? <laughs> um, a HEMCAP member needs to be a patient leader. It needs to be involved in hematology advocacy in the area within Europe. It needs to have a deep understanding of the challenges that patients face. Um, and it, he needs or she needs to have a significant expertise in R&D, access to EU policy and so on. So these topics we, we mentioned before. However, not only in the country that person comes from. That is very important. It needs to be a European perspective. The CAP, every CAP participant must attend the training. It's the same protocol as with the other disease areas. Attend the preparatory sessions, attend the full CAP meeting, sign the confidentiality form, and be fluent in English. I know some people may challenge that, but uh, we definitely need English-speaking people at this meeting. Um, so there is a huge list of responsibilities which I won't go through, um, but, uh, but this is just for you to highlight how strictly regulated a CAP meeting is. And, and here comes the point that um, 
that I think is the most interesting. Um, how are we preparing our community? How is MPE preparing the patient community to be able to feed into a system like this? It doesn't mean that we're gonna do it. It just means how are we bringing you know, a certain group of people to the level of knowledge that we need them in order to um, input to the different stakeholders that we need to be involved in, be it industry, the regulators, academia, how, how do we do that? So the approach we've taken is by um, initiating the MPE Advocate Development Program. And I know we have some graduates already in the room. <laughs> we have, I think, Vada, um, we have Lara, we have Tone, we have Rika, and am I missing anyone? Well, you're a student still. <laughs> but yes, could you please stand up, the trainees and the graduates, please, just for the people to see who is involved. Also, also you, please. <laughs> well. <laughs> brave, brave people. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> So last year was a pilot, and um, and I mean, obviously one always feels a bit of uh, not not pity, but you know it's hard work to be participant of a pilot because you always you know have to then ensure that the program is improved. So I, I thank you very much for you know being the guinea pigs last year, and hopefully the trainees of this year will you know benefit from that. Um, <clears throat> what is the ADP, the so-called ADP, Advocate Development Program? Well, it's um, nothing less than the first disease-specific training program for patient advocates in myeloma. Um, it's an annual program that runs for eight months. It combines different topics uh, from, uh, you know, knowing what myeloma is and how, how the disease um, uh, develops and how it functions what the existing treatments are, guidelines, R&D roadmap, regulatory roadmap, and that those disease-specific topics are combined with cross-disease topics, which you know you could find maybe at some other places like Eupati, or you could go and pick at the Euro the Summer School and so on. Um, but we've tried to capture all of that. We've went through the materials of these other programs and tried to capture every everything that we thought was relevant for, for the trainees and for someone who's involved in myeloma advocacy. Um, it's done via e-learning, but that is combined with face-to-face -face sessions. Last year we had two face-to-face -face sessions and this year we'll have three face-to-face -face sessions at the uh, EHA Congress in June, at ESMO in October, and at ISPOR in November. And why are we doing this? Well. The, the rationale behind that is that if you train people and you only bombard them with theory, they're soon gonna forget. However, if you attach it to a Congress where actually that what you've taught is going to be you know, implemented and they're gonna live it, it is much easier for them to assimilate and to also see what the reason behind everything is. Why are we doing this? Why do I need to learn this? Well, guess what? In that session, you have a professor speaking about very highly complex issues. And if you've learned your stuff, you'll be able to ask, to ask tough questions and to say, well, you know, why wasn't the patient involved in that trial? And the response of that professor might be very complex and you'll be able to reply to that. And that is the whole, the, the whole point of um, not, not only requesting ha to have a seat at the table, we were discussing that yesterday, but having a seat at the table means also having something to say that is meaningful and the way you do it, because by doing it that way, we'll achieve you know, being taken seriously. Um, <clears throat> we have two dedicated uh, tutors to the course um, and an ongoing platform for the alumni, and we're very happy if they join and continue being part and continue learning. Um, and um, the pilot of last year had six trainees, and this year I believe we have six trainees as well. And this is how it looks integrated in the whole system of hematology. 
it looks a bit uh, complex. You'll receive the slide so you can have a look at that um, later. Um, but I just wanted to, you to see, and I'm not sure whether I can point, but I can't, I think. Um, the, the red, the one with the red circle, there you can see the ADP that is integrated into the whole European Hematology Association Annual Congress and the capacity building, which we also co-shape as MPE, because what we want to achieve is not duplicate, but ensure that the capacity building suits also the people that have attended the ADP. So we attach it to the Congress, we have the session, and I mean, the trainees of last year can explain that to you, and, um, and integrated, we even got an endorsement from EHA, and then they run off to the Congress to the capacity building, and after that, they run off to the sessions. And then this year, what we've integrated is a debrief after each of the scientific sessions to make sure that people have really understood what, what is happening there. Okay, and here's my question to you. If we were to have a myeloma cap, because I mean, certainly we have enough knowledge, um, you know, within this room, for example, to, um, to run an initiative like this, what topics do you think would have to be addressed in that cap meeting? And what questions would you want that companies respond to? And I want you to take a piece of paper. We have two minutes left. And you know, even if it's only one bullet point, I don't care. <clears throat> I need to collect ideas because afterwards they say you're not evidence-based. But <laughs> um, please write just whatever comes to your mind that you say, well, this has never, you know, we need an answer to this in order to move forward in our advocacy work. What responses do you need in your advocacy work? And what topics do you think are very relevant for myeloma patients and need to be discussed with industry? How many minutes, Anna, do we have? Three or four? Okay. I'd be very grateful. And, and I'll collect them afterwards. In the meantime, do you have any questions? I mean, I'm here the whole weekend, so if you have any questions, you can chase me. And Jan is coming afterwards, so you can chase him. So Louise, has, uh, Louise from Novartis has a couple of comments to share with us. Uh, she's attended several of these community advisory boards with um, the CML community. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on this concept. Um, we certainly believe it's a very important evolution with the uh, community. And I just put a little list of things that uh, basically are really important about these. First of all, it's a very honest conversation. Sometimes it can be very challenging conversation, but it's a very honest conversation where the community holds us accountable for commitments that we've made to the community. 
but we also hold the community accountable for what we would like to see coming from the community. So it's a very challenging conversation at times, but a very honest and transparent conversation. We also um, come out of these sessions with a to-do list um, and building on what Ananda was saying, we then go away, do our homework and come back and report back on our homework at the next one. So it really builds from one meeting to the next. Um, the people who attend the meeting are driven by the agenda that's developed by the community. And this is very important to keep in mind because at the last one, for example, you have access to some of the most senior people in the organization, maybe for the first time. So the people who showed up at the last CML advisory board, just to give you an example, were our head of global legal. This is the person who sits in the US at the head of global legal. Also there was the head of global marketing. In this case, marketing was there because there was a marketing uh, uh, item agenda. You had the head of global development. I mean, these people typically don't come to meetings like this. There is also the head of global patient relations. So you have access to some of the most senior members of an organization, and this is where you have the greatest impact because these meetings are small, you have one-to-one -one conversations with them. But what we also started to see is a very profound impact on our senior management why patient engagement is important. They need to hear it from you. I'm patient relations, I'm a big advocate, and I go around knocking on people's doors, but when they hear it from you personally, it has a significant impact. Um, it also has made us rethink how we run advisory boards. I mean, this is so well organized that we've gone back to the drawing board now to look at why are we doing advisory boards? How are we doing them? Are we doing them in the appropriate way? So it's really started to change how we think as an organization. So as I mentioned, the conversations can be very tough. They can be very challenging, but I think it's the way we need to move uh, to have a real uh, meaningful partnership moving forward. So congratulations and we're delighted to be involved. Thanks a lot, Louise, for that. I think that was important, the contribution. Um, could we maybe collect another um, the points, the bullet points from attendees? Thanks. Okay, so um, if any of you hasn't yet handed in the bullet points, you can do that at the end of the session. We're now um, passing on to uh, the case studies of uh, two of our members. The first one is Vada, who's gonna, who represents Amen from Israel. And uh, Vada, I give you the floor. Presentation. Okay. Um, the
the Israeli uh, Amen organization, one of its biggest mission is to introduce the new drugs into the Israeli health basket. And I take uh, the latest uh, um, committee that was in last uh, December as an example. So uh, we ran a campaign to introduce the DARA into the Israeli health basket. And as you know, the DARA is a mono monoclonal antibody, which is used in combination with the Rivalimid and Dextabetazone. <clears throat> now, a little bit background. The Israeli Health Basket Committee meets uh, from November to December. In the end of December, 31st of December, they make their decision, <clears throat> which is a very critical period because all Europe and America are on vacation. And as you know, the headquarters are either in uh, Europe or in the, in the States. Now, this, uh, this committee <clears throat> is consist of half our medical uh, persons and half are other people like uh, from the education area, arena, from uh, lawyers, from treasury office, <clears throat> and they don't have any background about uh, drugs. So uh, all new technologies and drugs compete in this process, and the whole budget is 110 million euro. This is the, the budget to introduce new technologies and drugs. <clears throat> in recent years, we had dermatologist in the committee which is crucial because if you have a uh, medical staff there, they don't always understand the hematology, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> area. They don't know the drugs. They don't understand the, all the processes. They, maybe they know about orthopedic issues, but uh, they don't know all the clinical material. So now the challenges. In Israel, the Ratumumav was in the fourth line treatment, and there was a challenge to move it to the second line. In 2017, 16 million of 110 million was for myeloma treatments. And when a committee is sitting again a year after it, they say, okay, myeloma patients are only a, a very low percentage of the population, they got last year 16 million out of 110 million. So let's uh, have a budget for other uh, patients, which we can understand. And this is a challenge. Uh, also, uh, to a drug, the most expensive drug that ever uh, was submitted, submitted for reimbursement was like about six to eight percent. And the uh, Dratumumav, we started with a budget of 65 million in order to give it for all for second line treatment. The cost was 65, uh, 65 million, which is 60% of the budget. So this was a big challenge. And the other challenge was that uh, no, uh, no hemat hematologist was in the committee. We tried our best to convince all you know, the com uh, community that hematologists should be in the committee, but the, po the fact was that we didn't have any hematologists in the committee. And there were competitors. As you know, uh, myeloma is not a sexy disease. There was a big campaign for a drug for children for orphan disease at a cost of estimated 35 million uh, euro. And they had a great campaign, and also they had a very good connection to the Ministry of Health. And it was a challenge. Now, the decision strategy, we had the, the decision was either to give 
to reimburse the DARA for second line for high risk, which are about uh, 33% of the patients, or to uh, reimburse it for all patients in second line. Now, uh, the fact was that for the second line in Israel, there were three other options. It was the latuzumab with uh, Revlimid, Exasumis with uh, Revlimid, and Carfilzumib with Revlimid. So we didn't think, and all the community didn't think, that there is a really great benefit to introduce a fourth uh, a drug to the high risk. And all of us understood that it should be for all patients in second line. Now, we knew that there should be a really creative solution as far as the financial issue. And um, we started to talk, to talk with the pharmaceutical companies and the metallurgists. And now I will explain what we did. We started with lobbying. We made uh, face to face uh, meetings that we start uh, around uh, June, half a year before, with all key opinion leaders in the Israeli metallurgy uh, group. And the mission is to create a unified voice. Because the hematology group, they submit a list of drugs to the committee. And we know that if, if the myeloma drug is not in the first five locations, there is no uh, any chance that it will be included in the basket. So we go from hematologist to hematologist and we talk with them in order we don't make the decision, but we help to get to the situation that everybody, uh, uh, that they create a list and that the myeloma drug will be in the first place, second place, third place. Also, uh, we try to, to influence the dermatologist will be in the committee. This year we didn't succeed. It. And we meet with people that uh, make decisions in the Ministry of Health, and we just give them information about patient needs. We cannot tell them, uh, you know, what to choose. We just give them information about our patient needs. Uh, we have uh, a lot of meetings with the pharmaceutical company. And this year, we explained the pharmaceutical company that the DARA was in the first place. But they take a lot of responsibility. Because if they are not going to give a really good financial solution, so they keep a place of other drug like Revlimid for first line that we don't have in Israel. And they have responsibility for that, responsibility for that. So we have a lot of meetings and talks with the pharmaceutical company. Now, what we did, we went with a public campaign. Patients wrote a lot of letters. There are patients that got the DARA uh, either through uh, insurance, through compassion uh, programs, or through clinical uh, trials. So we find out who are these patients, and they wrote letters. Um, also, we ask the head of the hematology group and other doc doctors to send letters to the committee members about the uh, clinical benefits. Because as you know, in the, in, the, in the committee, there are people that don't understand. They don't know what is the uh, uh, myeloma patients and what is the uh, daratuma. So we have to educate them in a very tactic uh, way that they will understand the benefits of this drug. Uh, we did a, a Facebook campaign where we posted the, some posts and we target the people in the committee. Around October, this is the time that we know who will be in the committee. It's not the same people every year. So we try to find some uh, relationship, some connection to these people, and we try to get, they don't like us to talk to them, but we try to somehow to reach them. Um, we send a 
patients send the WhatsApps in the form to these committee members. If it's patients, it's much better than we as an organization will do it. And as I said, we have unofficial uh, contacts with the members and uh, we try to uh, send them letters or to get some contacts with them, which is very difficult to do. Um, we publish professional articles about uh, 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 the drug in the press in different sites. Uh, one of the, the internet uh, campaign that we used was uh, I'm Optimistic. We took the stim we photographed uh, patients and they told their story how they benefited from the DAR drug. So how they are optimistic about life and how life can be much better. I don't know if I can show it here. Can I, we press it? Can we show it? We try. If not, okay, never mind. Okay. Uh, one of the Facebook, another Facebook campaign that we used, and uh, all our members of this association were dressed in uh, red, as you see. The campaign was in our blood, in our bl blood to include the new drugs for myeloma patients to save their life. And each one told his uh, personal story. So it was very touching. And people like, uh, it was uh, many, many people were exposed to this uh, campaign. And many of them click on the post to read more. So this is one example. And here we have another example. One of our uh, uh, members, uh, she took her parents and they dressed in red and they told their stories. The result, daratumumab was reimbursed uh, for all second line for myeloma patients, for all patients. And I must uh, tell you that the last night was uh, the 31st of December. We got information from the committee that the uh, financial uh, budget is too high by uh, I think five million or something like that. We called the pharmaceutical company. They were sitting all night in the offices. I don't know how, but they communicate with somebody with Euro uh, in Europe that was in a ski vacation or something like that. And they, ca and they got the discount of five million and it was like a, a big thing. Uh, it was approved despite co uh, opposition of the finance ministry representative and those who preferred in the same amount to include five other drugs. It's a big issue because people said, okay, it's a huge budget, but in this budget we can include five different drugs. So it was a challenge. Uh, in the past two years, I can say the 35 million was allocated for myeloma patients, which is about 18% of all uh, the approval for medication. So I guess next year will be much more difficult for us. Uh, and I can say thank you, because the State of Israel really is one of the widest uh, public, uh, public coverage in the world for myeloma patients. Um, Conclusion, I think the key is to brand the disease. And here I can say and ask the MPE that they can, I think they can help in producing a film for a, raising the awareness of myeloma in all the countries. It can be a one film that everybody can go uh, do voice over it. And we can use the film to raise awareness in the, use it in uh, Facebook and use it in uh, other uh, social. Uh, uh. Now, uh, the other thing, the crucial factor is to establish a united uh, front line among the hematologists. 
that everybody that will be very united as far as what is the first and second and third drug in their list. Uh, I think that we have as an organization the responsibility to deliver the messages and to uh, present our patients in the letters, WhatsApps, Facebook, and all other uh, methods. And uh, I think we cannot be involved in the pricing uh, issues with the pharmaceutical companies, but we can do a lot to let them have the responsibility for our patients. And that, that's what we did with the pharmaceutical company. So thank you. So now, thanks a lot, Vada, for that insight. And now I'm going to give the floor to Rika, who's coming from Finland. And uh, she's going to be talking about uh, her attendance at the CHMP, at the EMA, uh, for the reassessment of um, Apledispin. I don't know how to use this, so maybe I just try. Green button. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm here to uh, talk about my experiences in, at the European Medicines Agency. I got to attend the SAG meeting and the CHMP meeting there this March. Um, I'm a patient uh, uh, since I was diagnosed in 2011 and uh, I have a little background with, uh, with that being a patient, I know about myeloma, but with the experience of ADP, like Ananda told us, that, told you that I was uh, attending a course last year, uh, I could, I was confident in taking part of this, uh, these meetings, and I agreed to do it. So, okay, I go back. Oh, I have gone back so many slides already, sorry. <laughs> uh, the purpose of this presentation is to explain my experience and how I felt in the meetings and all that. Uh, it is important to have patients present at these kind of meetings so that we have our voices heard. Uh, the benefits of the advocate development program are really good and it's really important that patients get that kind of education so that we can go uh, forward and attend in the meetings like this. The, uh, about the EMA, EMA has these committees. Uh, committee for uh, the CHMP is Committee for Medical Products for Human Use. It's a scientific committee uh, of the EMA. It assesses the safety and clinical effectiveness of a medicine. Uh, it gives either positive or negative recommendation for the medicines. That means the, it's, the medicine is either approved or disapproved for the marketing, for the market. Uh, the European Commission makes, makes the final decision on the approval. It gives the stamp uh, on the medicine if it's approved. Negative decision means uh, a drug is unlikely to be uh, made available for the patients. The scientific advisory group, the SAG, uh, is a committee called by the CHMP to provide advice to the CHMP on the patient and clinician perspective on the new medicine. 
A SAC is always called in an appeal of a CHMP decision. Uh, unfortunately, I am not able to talk about the discussions uh, what uh, what ha and what happened in the meetings because it is all confidential, uh, nor can I share any documents that I was provided. So I can't answer any questions about those things later on. The background of this uh, re-examination. The medicine in question was called aplidin, and it's a new medicine. And it, well, uh, it got refusal uh, last uh, December, and it applied. It wanted to get the approval, so it applied. So I was called uh, in the late January and asked if I would like to attend the meeting. And I guess that's because I've had attended the ADP program. So Kate Morgan called me and asked if I would be confident in joining the meetings. And I said, I had to think about it first, but I felt that, okay, I know a little bit, or maybe a little bit more, <laughs> and I, I did it. I wanted to go. So um, uh, the CHMP committee was uh, not convinced that the survival benefits of the medicine outweighed the risks uh, for patients. As the side effects were worse in the apl aplidin arm, the CHMP were not convinced that it would be beneficial to add to the myeloma, myeloma pathway. Um, PharmaMar, which was the company that produced aplidin, submitted this appeal. Also, MPE wrote to the CHMP to outline the patient perspective of the medicine. And then I was invited. Uh, following uh, the appeal, uh, the SAG was convened to discuss specific issues in relation to the ongoing re-evaluation of aplodin. Patient representative, representatives with experience of myeloma were invited to participate the meetings in order to contribute patient perspective when appropriate. The SAC consisted of five core members and six additional multiple myeloma experts. These were all clinicians, professors, etc. They were all very hardcore specialists. For example, someone was specialized on methodology, methodology and statistics. They were very, very good in their professions. They were excellent experts. Uh, the atmosphere at the ZAC meeting was quite informal, especially after the pharma left the room. The debate was very good, and uh, I felt very comfortable in that situation. I was asked questions, and I could jump in the discussion whenever I wanted to. Um, the focus of the SAG meeting. During the SAG, the committee explores the ground uh, for the re-examination presented by the company. The committee wanted to explore the clinician and patient perspective on the dr drug, um, the advantages and disadvantages, how it might be used in the real world setting, patient thoughts on the survival benefits and side effects, clinicians' perspective on the clinical trial experience. Participants in the committee were allowed to respond to the questions that CHMP asked, contributing to the overall re-examination of the drug. The SAC, meeting, SAC meeting's discussion and the, and the debate were extremely enjoyable. 
to listen and interesting to follow. The experts were firing questions towards Pharma Mars representatives and they tried to answer the questions as well as they could. It was kind of like being on a trial. It was really, really interesting. Um, the CHMP oral examination followed after two weeks after the SAG meeting. I didn't know when I um, agreed to join the SAG that I will be also invited to this uh, CHMP oral hearing or oral examination, I, excuse me. Um, and it was very different setting than the SAG. Uh, during the SAG, I was, uh, I was attending the whole SAG meeting. But this uh, CHMP um, uh, oral hearing had already started and, and I was escorted to the room for maybe for just a little bit over an hour I was at the room, in the room. And the chair introduced the topic and the patient representatives. I was there in the room and Hans was there via teleconference. Uh, the reporters, uh, provided a brief introduction after which the company came into the room and gave presentation. This is the same sort of stuff that happened also in the SAG. Uh, there was a question and answer session. Also the patient representatives were given a chance to ask the questions. I had already asked my questions during the SAG meeting, but Hans was asking something during this session. Uh, after that, Pharma left the room and the committee continued uh, the discussion on the benefits and risks of Apladin. The issues that were in, on focus in the CHMP. Uh, assessment of the applicant's position. Assessment of the applicant's response. Ground for re-examination, benefits, risk, benefit, risks. Updated benefits, risk balance, both from re-examination rapporteur and the go rapporteur. Conclusions and recommendation to the CHMP following the re-examination. Questions proposed to be addressed to the ZAC Oncology. <coughs> Challenges of being involved. Completing a number of forms prior to the SAC meeting. Uh, and there were many. Every time I thought this, is, this must be the final form I'm filling, I have finished, I got another one. Also, the documents arrived really late. Uh, for example, for the CHMP meeting, I think I got last document of, uh, less than 12 hours before the meeting. So uh, there were a huge number of papers and documents that came only to maybe two days or one day uh, ahead prior to the meeting. Uh, what I felt was the most difficult part was the fact that I could not discuss uh, the issues with anyone. Uh, it was all confidential and that's why it was impossible. I wanted to discuss with someone but I just couldn't. There were also a huge number of abbreviations in the documents and they made the reading and understanding difficult and slow. Um, Luckily, they provided uh, something like eight pages of abbreviations list, which was like a dictionary. So it was re I was reading the papers with the dictionary. And, and what they give, I was given advice uh, prior to the meeting that I have to identify the issues that are important to me when I attend the meeting.
this, is, this, this was to the, what is expected from a patient representative. Uh, the role is to contribute from a patient viewpoint whenever it is relevant, taking into we can, account we the focus. Yes? One minute, please. One Otherwise, minute. we won't have a coffee break. Okay, thanks to Kate, I have so many slides. <laughs> the number doubled last night. Okay, I'm, tr I'm doing this really quick. <laughs> the role is to contribute from a patient viewpoint whenever it is relevant, taking into account the focus of the meeting. A patient representative is not expected to understand or contribute to the scientific elements of the discussions. There is no need to read all of the documents you get access to unless you want to. You are given specific sections to read. This is very important to know. EMA covers the expenses. expenses. This means that the patients are not financially burdened by participating in the decision making of EMA. Overall experience. I felt it was very valuable and interesting, a very good experience. Felt very welcomed. Everything was very well taken care of by the EMA. And Kate was helping me all the way. Final decision. The CHMP committee upheld the final decision. Uh, in the public statement, the CHMP concluded that the despite the re-examination, the data continued to show a small survival benefit, which was not enough to justify the side effects for the patients. So applicant got refusal again. Conclusions. Excellent opportunity to learn more about EMA and for uh, the process of the marketing authorization. I would recommend this experience to anyone who is interested and has a little background knowledge on these issues. The patients need to be heard, so go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rika. I think that was very important that you explain your experience to, to the MPE members. So what I would uh, like to ask you is if you have any questions for Rika or for Vada, you keep them for the coffee breaks and for the lunchtime. They'll be here um, until Sunday. Um, what I'd like you to do now, we have a coffee break, but the coffee break has been eaten up. So please go and get your coffee and, and then move to the uh, breakout sessions with your coffee cup. Um, you have uh, the list of uh, the uh, attendees. Okay, so Hans, take over. Uh, well, um, just to invite you uh, for the, the, the coming um, uh, the, the, com uh, the coming part of the program, the workshops. Um, if you uh, didn't uh, choose already for uh, one of the, the workshops, just do. Uh, at the end um, uh, of the, this room, uh, on the um, uh, on the doors, you see the uh, the workshops and the names. Who, of the people who choose for the for the workshops and also the room where it will be, if you didn't uh, already, just uh, choose your um, your workshop you want to uh, join. So have um, have a good workshop part of this program. Thank you. <laughs>